At least 13 people are dead after flash floods and mudslides slam into homes in California. The torrent of mud swept through communities near Santa Barbara. One man heard a baby buried in the mud. Pull it out alive. Dug down, found a little baby. I don't know where it came from. Yeah. Got it out, got the mud out of its mouth. Houses have been crushed by boulders the size of small cars which rolled down the hillside after heavy rain, the first for months. We'll have the latest from California, where rescuers are hoping to find more survivors. Also this lunchtime, cancer patients face possible delays to their treatment at an Oxford hospital because of a shortage of staff, claims a leading doctor. British manufacturing is riding high. Figures show output has reached its highest level in 10 years. Thousands of people are trapped in the Swiss resort of Zermatt after heavy snowfall. One British skier waiting to be airlifted out says it's been worrying. We just tried to stay as safe as possible uh, and eliminate any risks rather than taking any risks and going out walking. And Billy the Wiz, the teenage racing driver, is back behind the wheel nine months after losing both legs in a horrific crash. In the south, a leaked memo warns cancer patients could face delays in their treatment because of staff shortages. And the spending watchdog criticises Southern Railway for providing poor value for money. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. At least 13 people have been killed in Southern California after mudslides and flash floods. The death toll is expected to rise. Huge boulders roll down hillsides, crushing cars and smashing into homes after the first rain for several months in Santa Barbara County. More than 30 miles of the main coastal road have been closed. Rescuers are trying to reach a group of 300 people thought to be trapped in one neighborhood east of Santa Barbara. James Cook reports from Los Angeles. The rains came suddenly just before dawn, torrential and terrifying. They coursed over the slick, scorched earth, gathering speed until mud was roaring down to the sea like an express train. The deluge smashed into the very homes which had just survived California's biggest recorded wildfire. The result, utter devastation. We had a very difficult time assessing the area and responding to many of those areas to assist those people. Uh, the only words I can really think of to describe what it looked like was it looked like a World War I battlefield. A good friend of mine, whose name I won't mention, um, lost a father-in-law. Um, I still have two friends missing right now. Um, so it's devastating. The fire created a situation where the, the dirt was able to wash down. Had we still had all of the vegetation on the hills, it, it would not have been as much of an issue. Despite dangerous conditions, helicopters took to the skies, winching to safety dozens of people who were stranded amid The stories of survival are almost unbelievable. Uh, I heard the rumble of the rocks and I looked over at the river and the trees were just coming down, choo, choo, choo. And we ran into the house, and right then the, the boulders busted through our house. And we got upstairs, and it, it got up to uh, about eight feet, nine feet up the stairs. And uh, we would crawl out our window to the roof. The house is wiped out, just took everything out. And then later, uh, we were worried about a neighbor's house, and we went over to see. I went over to see if uh, they were okay, and we heard a, a little baby cry. And, uh, Came over and, uh, dug down, found a little baby. I don't know where it came from. Uh, got it out, got the mud out of it. I'm hoping it's okay. They took it right to the hospital. But it was just a baby four feet down in the mud in nowhere under the rocks. I'm glad we got it. But who knows what else is out there. The community's hardest hit were Montecito and Carpinteria on the north of Los Angeles. These are some of the most exclusive neighborhoods in the United States, home to stars like Oprah Winfrey. This is how deep the mud is. And how 
bouncing back is gone. Ellen DeGeneres posted this photo online. This is not a river, she wrote on Twitter. This is the 101 freeway in my neighborhood right now. Montecito needs your love and support. The damage isn't confined to the coast. This is the Los Angeles suburb of Burbank. Well, the mud roared down here with terrifying speed, sweeping everything in its path. The firefighters won't let us go up there any further. They say the situation could change in the blink of an eye. And as you can see, this is how dangerous it is. Rescue workers are still scouring cores of damage and searching for survivors. Police say the number of dead here is certain to rise. James Cook, BBC News, in Southern California. A senior doctor has warned that cancer care at an NHS specialist hospital is becoming unsustainable because of staff shortages. A leaked memo to staff at Oxford's Churchill Hospital said patients are facing delays to the start times of their chemotherapy treatment as nurse numbers are down by about 40%. A hospital trust spokesperson said there are no formal plans to change cancer treatment. Our health editor Hugh Pym is outside the hospital in Oxford. So Hugh, what is happening there? Explain the background to this. Well, the background, Sophie, is this leaked email is from a very senior doctor here at the Churchill Hospital, a leading cancer care centre in this part of England. And it follows a meeting with clinical leads, that's other leading clinicians in the hospital, where it is said that because of staffing shortages for cancer nurses, they are beginning to delay the start of chemotherapy for some cancer patients to four weeks. Now the national target is four weeks for the start of treatment so they will remain within their target but clearly implied in this is there'll be some patients who might have started chemotherapy within a couple of weeks that'll be moved out to four. It also says that urgent cases and new cases chemotherapy will continue as usual but there will, will be possible changes for others maybe in a terminal stage of cancer the amount of chemotherapy they get. Now the trust here which covers the Churchill Hospital is adamant there are no formal plans to change anything. They say they are meeting their cancer targets but they do acknowledge there is a staffing shortage particularly finding nurses uh, in the southeast of England generally with uh, the cost of living and so on and that's really exposed I think a major issue across the NHS. Hugh Pym, our health editor in Oxford, thank you. Well, the NHS dominated the first Prime Minister's questions of this year. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, said there's evidence of a crisis in the health service, but the Prime Minister, Theresa May, insisted it's better prepared than ever before. Our assistant political editor, Norman Smith, is in Westminster. Norman, a new year, but the Prime Minister still under huge pressure over the state of the NHS. Sophie, Mrs May has frequently said recently that she wants to be able to talk about non-Brexit issues, about a domestic agenda like the health service. She got her opportunity today, but perhaps not in the way she wanted, with angry, angry exchanges with the Labour leader as he sought to crank up the pressure on Mrs May over the state of the NHS this winter, saying under leadership it was sinking and attacking Mrs May for promoting Mr Hunt in the recent reshuffle giving him control of social care when Mr Corbyn said he should have been sacked pointing to cancelled non-urgent operations this winter the hours people were having to wait in ambulance outside A&E and Mrs May prompted a degree of incredulity labor benches when she suggested that the NHS was better prepared this winter than ever before pointing to the fact that there was more money more acute beds more people were taking out flu jabs at GP said more, more of them were open over the holiday period but just have a listen to how heated some of those exchanges were she told the house the NHS was better prepared for winter than ever before <laughs> So what words of comfort does the Prime Minister have to the 17,000 patients waiting in the back of ambulances in the last week of December? Is it that nothing is perfect by any chance? I fully accept that the NHS is uh, under pressure over winter. It uh, is regularly under pressure at winter times. Uh, I have been very, I've been very clear. I apologise to those people who've had their operations delayed. What we learn is that for all the time we at Westminster spend talking about Brexit, Mr Corbyn and probably Mrs May know that for many...
Is the issue that matters above all others is still the NHS. Norman Smith in Westminster, thank you. We're going to take you back now to our main story and those mudslides in California. At least 13 people are dead, but there are also warnings that the death toll could rise. Rescuers are still searching for survivors. Carter Evans from CBS News is in Montecito in California, which has been badly hit. Extraordinary scenes there. And this is the area that was hit not so long ago by the fire. Yes, and that made it worse, Sophie, because the fire scorched the hillsides and burned all the vegetation away. And then it, you add the rain to that, and well, you get mudslides. And I want to explain to you, know, a lot of people think these mudslides is just kind of a couple of feet of soupy mud. That's not the case. This is what's in that mud. Uh, it is dynamic. It is rushing downhill very fast. Imagine this. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. You're sound asleep in that comes blasting through your home. Here's a look at one of these homes. It, it ripped the front wall right off the home there. I mean, you, you can see the devastation that this caused. And, and this home, out of all of these that were damaged, is uh, actually in pretty good shape right now. And are they hoping to find more survivors? They are hoping to find more survivors, uh, and they're going to continue to look at it again today. Uh, so here's the problem right now. I mean, you've got all this debris, you've got homes covered, and, and, and in some cases, they've got to dig through this. So the rescue effort is going to continue today, and they do expect to find more people. Survivors, we're not so sure. Carter Evans in Southern California, thank you very much. UK manufacturing output has reached its highest level in nearly a decade after recording its seventh consecutive month of growth in November. Renewable energy projects, boats, aeroplanes and cars for export helped grow output by 3.9% between September and November compared with the same period in 2016. Our economics correspondent Andy Verity has the details. company makes precision metal components for everything from surgical implants to rear view mirrors and business is booming. It's been winning business from customers around the world from pharmaceutical manufacturers to tool makers and it's now looking forward to its strongest year for a decade. We've always exported uh, a huge percentage of what we make. Currently that's around 75 percent. Um, global growth of our customers and the manufacturing supply chain means growth for us. Um, so it's been uh, vital in terms of our success in the last 12 months and will remain to be going forward. This is how well manufacturing's done. In the three months to the end of November, the biggest rise in seven years. And there's more manufacturing going on now than there has been for 10 years. That's had its effect on the deficit, the trade deficit, the difference between what we sell abroad and what we buy in from abroad. That shrank to 6.2 billion. That's down by 2.1 billion pounds. That improving trade position was helped by the car industry. While we're buying fewer of them, we're selling more of them abroad. And British companies that make machines that do the manufacturing, so-called capital goods, are tapping into growing demand for their products around the world. The UK transport sector has performed particularly strongly over the last decade. There's been a huge focus on improving efficiency in the car industry in particular and a, an enormous amount of innovation looking at uh, new models, um, fuel efficiency, new materials and that's really tapped into a, a customer base which is looking to buy those kinds of products. So we've been very much in tune with uh, the, 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 the customers um, that are out there globally. Eight to eight at four the sale of works of art to foreign customers also helped to lift the UK's export numbers. The weak pound means foreign buyers with dollars, euros or yen to spend can buy more British art for their money. But construction has been shrinking now for six months. In the three months to November, the amount of work being done was down by 2%. This once booming sector is now struggling to extract itself from a slump. Andy Verity, BBC News. A 16-year-old boy has appeared in court charged with the murder of a shop worker in London on Saturday. 49-year-old Vijay Patel was attacked during an argument about the sale of cigarette papers on Saturday. An online crowdfunding page has been set up by the nearby Mill Hill Synagogue to help Mr Patel's family. It has already raised more than £12,000. Police say they found... A Body in a garden after a woman told them she'd killed a man and buried him there a number of years ago. She's been arrested on suspicion of murder and is being held in custody. The body was discovered at a property near Stockport. Judith Moritz is there.
there for us. Now, what more do we know, Judith? Well, Sophie, the police say that the woman who's 63 turned up at a police station on Sunday and they say she told them she confessed that she had killed a man some years ago and that she'd buried him in the garden of a property in this road. Well, that sparked a forensic search and last night detectives confirmed that they have indeed found human remains here. Uh, it's believed that this is the body of a man named Kenneth Coombs. We know that neighbours around this area have been asked by detectives if they remember a man by that name, that he was in his late 80s in 2004. And the BBC understands that the woman who has now been questioned on suspicion of murder is Kenneth Coombs' daughter. Well, Greater Manchester Police say that their murder investigation is in its early stages and there are many questions which still have answers. Judith Morris, thank you. The president of South Korea says Donald Trump deserves credit for helping to foster their first talks with North Korea in two years. Moon Jae-in said pressure from America and sanctions may well have made the meeting possible. The talks took place yesterday in the demilitarized zone which has divided the two Koreas since 1953. Sophie Long reports from the South Korean capital, Seoul. Communication between the North and Korean governments has now been re-established. A North Korean delegation will be present at the Winter Olympics being hosted by the South. And a direct military hotline connecting the two Koreas has been reactivated. But there was barely a mention and certainly no movement on the fundamental issue of North Korea's nuclear and missile program. Today, the South Korean president said resolving that was the only pathway to peace. The denuclearization of the Korean peninsula is the fundamental pathway we need to follow. This cannot be compromised. This is the only way for us to achieve full peace in the Korean peninsula. Not everyone was in favor of the talks. Some believe that the North Korean leader's sudden willing to engage with its neighbor is by the desire to drive a wedge between those allied against him as the latest round of UN sanctions imposed on his regime really start to bite. But Moon Jae-in was adamant today that he would not allow that to happen. In terms of security and defense, South Korea and the United States are the closest of allies. We also share the same view of the significance of the threat from North Korea. So South Korea and the United States have been working closely together against North Korea's nuclear threat. Moon Jae-in vowed to make 2018 the turning point in inter-Korean relations. He hopes the Pyeongchang Games could mark the beginning of a process that would create a life for people here free from concerns about war. But given the year started with the North Korean and U.S. leaders exchanging threats and boasts about whose nuclear button was biggest, he has much ground to cover. Sophie Long, BBC News, Seoul. The time is coming up to 20 past one, our top story this lunchtime. At least 13 people are dead after flash floods and mudslides slam into homes in Southern California, areas hit by the recent wildfires. There are warnings the death toll could rise. And coming up, supportive or too soft, a new army recruitment campaign divides opinion. Stay with us for South Today as homelessness nearly doubles in one part of Dorset. A bus with beds on board will soon be helping keep people off the streets. And we catch up with a supple septuagenarian who gave Arnold Schwarzenegger a run for his money. Thousands of tourists have been left stranded after heavy snow in the Alps cut off towns and villages across Switzerland, France and Italy. Visitors are being airlifted out of Zermatt, one of Switzerland's most popular ski resorts, where around 13,000 people are trapped. The avalanche risk in the area is the toughest, the highest it's been for almost 10 years. In France, a 39-year-old British skier is still missing after bad weather hampered rescue efforts in Tien. Tom Burridge has the latest. This, the only way out of Zermatt this morning. The luggage of tourists stuck here, airlifted out. Heavy snow has closed all the roads, so those who can catch this shuttle service to a nearby town. Waiting on that helipad this lunchtime, Rebecca Smith. These are people who are waiting for the next helicopter out. The helicopter's about to leave. We spoke as she began the first leg 
of a long journey back to Manchester. A lot of people will say, oh, well, you're stuck in some ice, it's beautiful, you can go skiing and stuff, but I don't think they realise it's that's not the case. We've been stuck in a hotel room because obviously the risk of avalanche has been on maximum. And so this morning, helicopters also busy clearing avalanches, blowing huge quantities of snow off the mountains, which has fallen in recent days. In remote areas, one metre of snow fell in just 24 hours. And although conditions in Zermatt have improved this morning, the risk of avalanches in the area remains high. A Swiss company captured this avalanche just outside the town last week. The deadly force abundantly clear. And this the scene after a recent avalanche in the French town of Les Ouches. Further south in the resort of Tigne, a is hidden by the snow. It was here that John Brommel from Lincolnshire was snowboarding in poor weather on Sunday. He is still missing. In Zermatt, the operation to get tourists out on helicopters continues. Looking forward to getting back down the mountain. We live in Australia and we're going to miss our flight from Zurich. Happy to leave now. Heavy snow this winter has made many people skiing holidays. But with some slopes here now closed, too much is causing problems and treacherous conditions. Tom Burridge, BBC News. The Chancellor Philip Hammond and the Brexit Secretary David Davis are making separate visits to Germany to try to build support for a trade deal between the UK and the EU, includes financial services. In a joint article for a German newspaper, they say it makes no sense to put in place what they call unnecessary barriers to trade in services or goods. Our political correspondent Ben Wright is in Westminster and the question, of course, is will they be listened to? Well, you'll remember, Sophie, just before Christmas, there were high waves around Westminster among government ministers uh, when the broad terms of the divorce deal between Britain and the uh, EU was agreed, including the financial settlement uh, Britain will have to pay. But that was just the first step, really, the first hurdle that had to be cleared. What we're seeing now is the second phase of the Brexit negotiations, and it's all about the future relationship between the EU and the UK, in particular the, the trade relationship. So we are seeing two key ministers, the Chancellor and the Brexit uh, Secretary, who are on different sides during the referendum, showing a united front by going to Germany on this charm offensive, putting a chummy arm around German businesses and saying, look, even though Britain's leaving the single market and the customs union, can and still be at the end of this process a really close good trade deal between the EU and the UK that works in both sides in interests and the UK is asking for a bespoke deal that incorporates goods and services because as you say very worried about the future of the city of London so that's the case they're making in Germany for their part the EU is now for months uh, that they will not countenance a bespoke deal with the UK, that the UK can't cherry pick the best bits of the single market that it wants and that there can be no special arrangement for the City of London. So they go into these talks fairly far apart and while the UK is in Germany trying to woo German businesses and politicians, the EU throughout this process has so far shown, shown that it is very solid as a negotiating block. Ben Wright, thank you. A man who claims he was sexually abused as a child by the former football coach Barry Bunnell has told the court that he didn't report the abuse he suffered because he didn't want to spoil any chances of succeeding as a footballer. Barry Bunnell, who's now known as Richard Jones, denies 48 charges of child sexual abuse. David Ornstein is at Liverpool Crown Court for us now. David. So for yesterday, the prosecution laid out their case against Mr. Bunnell, describing him as a predatory and devious paedophile. Well, today we heard from the first witness, as you said, it was harrowing evidence, it must be said. Uh, this witness said that he met Barry Bunnell when he was playing for a youth team in the northwest of England in the early 1980s, aged between 11 and 13. Uh, and to quote him, he said, he used to flash his eyes at you, uh, made you feel special. Now, it was then said that Barry Bunnell would handpick the best players uh, and invite them to stay at his flat above a video shop uh, once a week, sometimes three to four times a week in holiday times. They would play fights, watch movies, and when the lights went out, music would come on very loudly and the abuse, abuse would begin, allegedly taking place for this individual in the tens of tens, he said, if not hundreds of times. It was a very emotional evidence, uh, and the cross-examination has now begun. It will continue 
continue after a break. Uh, Mr Bunnell faces 48 charges and this trial is expected to last for eight weeks. David, thank you. Stand in the way of becoming a soldier. Critics of the campaign say it shows the army has bowed to political corruption. Here's our defence correspondent, Jonathan Beale. Man up. Throw a pair. It's all right to cry. No emotion in the army. It is a recruitment campaign very different from the past. Part of what's called army belonging. The army is family. Voiced by soldiers to show there's emotional as well as physical support for new recruits. The adverts answer questions such as, I'd be gay and join the army, while a Muslim soldier explains how he can still practice his faith. Find a little corner um, and do your prayers there. All aimed at groups not seen as the traditional target audience, but minorities who might have been reluctant to sign up. Faith is such a part of me. Our traditional cohort would have been white male Caucasian 16 to 25 year olds, and there are not as many of those around as there once were. And our society is changing, and I think it's entirely appropriate for us, therefore, to try and reach out to a much broader base. The army's been struggling to recruit, made all the more difficult by a lack of a major campaign like Afghanistan or Iraq. War's often the best recruiting sergeant. It's also competing in an era of relatively high employment. The regular strength of the army should be 82,000, but it's currently just over 77,000 strong, a shortfall of more than 4,000. But some former soldiers question whether the army's trying to be too politically correct with these adverts. They're aiming their recruiting campaign at specific minorities. Actually, they should be aiming them far more broadly at the kind of people who will want to join the army, the people who are looking for, for a fight, looking for action, looking for adventure. This older advert is what people might expect from the army. A recent plan to drop its Be the Best motto because it was seen as elitist, was blocked by the Defence Secretary. There's more than one way to be the best. It is still an organisation whose job... The head of the army says it must broaden its appeal and reflect modern Britain. BBC News. 17-year-old Billy Monger was a star of Formula 4 racing. Then he had a horrific crash last April and had to have both legs amputated below the knee. But his recovery and determination have astounded doctors. And this week, Billy will be driving in front of crowds for the first time since... Tim Muffet reports. Billy Wiz, a nickname he was determined to keep. It's just nine months since Billy Munger had both his lower legs amputated after a car crash. This is a final practice before driving with a stunt team at Birmingham's NEC. The aim is to put on a good routine. We've got a great bunch of lads that are... That are I'm just hoping that everything goes smoothly and we, yeah, we can um, do ourselves proud. Donington Park last when Billy's Formula 4 car hit a stationary vehicle. All I wanted to do was to, to get through it and be alive. There was a slight moment when um, I thought I wouldn't drive again. It still doesn't change the dream. The dream stays the same, that I want to be an F1 driver. You've got your prosthetics here, and you're still able to control... So, I mean, many will find that really <laughs> extraordinary. When you control the pedal normally, you do it all through your ankle. That's how you control how much input that you're putting into the pedal. But with me, because I haven't got ankles, um, the way I simply control it is just through my leg like this and almost doing, rather than going like that, just doing a, a push motion instead to control the car. Upset the dynamics of the car. Terry Grant has been training Billy ahead of the Autosport International event. He's one of the world's top stunt drivers. Left, roll, drive out, drive out. Bang on. Billy is a very special lad for sure, um, regardless of his injuries. The moment you're rehearsing on, a, on an airfield, there's going to be concrete pillars up. The level of control that he's got now it, for prosthetic legs is just it's phenomenal. Although Billy can use the accelerator, his car is adapted so that this lever controls the brake. He's been backed by Mission Motorsport, a charity that typically helps wounded servicemen and women drive again, often in specially adapted cars.
their freedom of mobility it is a phenomenal thing. If that is taken away from you as an adult, it has a dramatic effect on your life. Uh, on your own personal freedoms and also I think a lot about the sort of your sense of self and your independence and to be able to give that back to somebody is, is an extraordinary thing to be able to do. What do your family think about the fact you're getting behind the wheel? My mum's very very nervous. If I don't do it what else am I going to do with my life? I need to make my life into something positive. Tim Muffet, BBC News. What an amazing young man. Helen Willits is here with all the latest weather now. We were talking earlier about the mudslides in California, all triggered by some very heavy rain. Absolutely, after an incredibly dry period, of course, as well, Sophie. But, yeah, look at this on the rainfall chart. Really intense rain. We had about two or three inches falling in the space of just a few hours. The good news, however, here is it's clearing away and actually for the coming four or five days we've got high pressure building in and that high pressure will ensure some dry weather here. So that's good news at least for the cleanup, but it might also produce some rains across the Caribbean. As for Europe, a storm battery Biscay today and that will head across the Pyrenees towards the Alps tomorrow so we could have further snowfall and some very windy weather as well. In contrast, here in the UK, stagnant air very quiet spell of weather and brighter as well we've still got our weather front in the east but it's much brighter for many parts i'm sure that's definitely lifted the spirits however not all had some rather stubborn fog and this Belfast just an hour or so ago and I doubt the fog will completely clear Northern Ireland now before the darkness falls again it will thicken up quite quickly again this evening we still have our rather leaden skies as well further east gray and damp that rain's been quite persistent today overnight the main hazard will be the fog but as of course temperatures will fall away close to freezing it could turn out to be freezing fog with a few icy patches as well so there are concerns about that through the night particularly the Severn Valley through central southern England, parts of Wales, northwest England, Northern Ireland again, and parts of the southwest of Scotland. As for the rest of Scotland, we hope the rain will start to clear away from the mainland. It will be a jolly chilly start, though. Temperature's pretty low first thing in the morning. And then we come further south, and I'm not as hopeful for sunshine tomorrow just because the fog will be more widespread, affecting many of our faster routes. So the major motorway network work could well have some disruption because of fog tomorrow morning. Further east, we've still got the remnants of our weather front so it'll be grey for another reason. Hill fog here, not as wet as today, but there'll be some persistent drizzle around, so nuisance value more than anything else. We will, of course, see some sunshine further west once the fog clears away, but it'll probably feel colder than today, probably five or six degrees. But again, if the sun's shining, that, of course, does compensate. Temperatures under the cloud around about seven or eight degrees, but even here it'll feel cold, and particularly where the fog lingers. Another repeat performance, really, tomorrow night, another cold night, icy patches, some fog around, some dense fog as we get towards morning. We have to wait, really, until next to clear it out of the way, because it looks promising weather front coming in, the wind strengthening, but that tends to fizzle out. The weekend, for most of us, looks dry, if rather grey, and again, the problems will be with the fog. Just, again, a, rewarder, really, a reminder, rather, for tomorrow morning that there will be some dense fog around, Sophie. Helen, thank you. And that is all from us now on BBC One. It is time for the news where you are. Have a very good afternoon. Bye-bye. Hello, good afternoon. You're watching South Today. I'm Tom Hepworth.